Hi, everybody. So today is Tuesday, and we are going to do something really fun. Uh, once again, I'm going to be reading to you from uh, the Bronze Bow, and I think that this is going to be the best way to deal with some of you who don't have your book with you. And um, if you have headphones, um, just put them on and uh, get into a position where you're going to stay awake and listen and pay attention to the things that are going on. Those of you that have your book, this is what I want you to do. You're going to turn to chapter 16. And uh, specifically, let's go to page 183. I'll give you a couple of seconds to find that page 183. Page 183. Now, when you get to 183, we are going to start where the <clears throat> paragraph starts with the phrase, when the shadows began. <clears throat> That's where we left off from the other video. We'll finish this chapter, and then I'm going to go right on into chapter 17, which is a short chapter. So let's start. When the shadows began to lengthen in the little room, they all knew with regret that this visit must end. Before they set up for the city, Daniel took Facia into his shop. You have brought so many gifts to Leah, he said, trying to choose his words carefully. Would you let me give one to you? He reached into a deep niche in the wall and drew out a small object wrapped in a fragment of Leah's blue cloth. <clears throat> Awkwardly, he laid in Thacia's hand the little brooch. I made it with a bit of scrap, he said. Thacia stood looking down at it. A bronze bow? She whispered. Do you remember? It was you who thought of it that night. That the bronze bow might mean some impossible thing. The thing that we could not do alone? I never forgot it. I don't know how to say it, but it came to stand for everything we're working for. For our oath for the kingdom, he had never seen Thacia before when she could not speak. He would remember as long as he lived the look that sprung into her eyes and was quickly hidden as she bent her head. Then her words came hurrying out. To think that you made it, she exclaimed, her voice shaky. Why, you ought to be a silversmith, Daniel. You shouldn't be working with these great chunks of iron. I'd like to try, he confessed, perhaps someday when we're at peace. It was the first time he had ever voiced his ambition, even to himself. They sat together along the road, they should with the, er the turban snugly about her head once more. Every time I come, Leah has changed, she told him. It's like watching a flower open very slowly. From week to week, I can hardly wait to see how it has opened since I saw her last. It's due to you, Daniel told her humbly. She has never seen a, she's never had a friend before. And after you leave, I see her trying to do things the way you do then. Thacia smiled at him. Little things, she said. Her hair and the way she folds her veil. That's not what I mean. She does almost all the work in the house now, he went on. But there are days when she goes back. He was grateful for a chance to speak of this to someone. Days when she doesn't pay any attention. It's hard for me to have patience enough. They just smiled again. No, no one would ever take you for a patient man, he, she said. But do you think Joel and I do not know what you have done for Leah? Daniel's gratitude went out to her. He would like to think that he had done something to make up for those years. She is so lovely, Thacia went on thoughtfully. I can't believe that there are really any demons in her. Have you ever asked a physician? The one in the village said there was no cure for her. Once there was a man traveling through the country with this, had some kind of magic to heal, a magic power to heal. And my grandmother paid him to look at Leah. He could not do anything either. He said that the demons that make a person afraid are the hardest to cast out. He said something queer. Leah was only a child, but he said that she did not want to be made well. Thacia was silent for a moment. I have heard Jesus say something like that when people ask him to cure them. Once there was a lame man on a litter, and Jesus bent over him and looked right in his face and asked him, do you want to be whole? It seemed such a queer question. Why would anybody want to stay crippled? Daniel hesitated. This was something he had thought about walking alone on the dark, silent road from Bethsaida. 
He was not sure of his own thoughts. Haven't you ever wondered, he attempted, what good it is for them to be healed, those people that Jesus cures? They're happy at first. But what happens to them after that? What does a blind man think when he has wanted for years to see and then looks at his wife in rags and his children covered with sores? That lame man you saw, is he grateful now? Is it worth it to get on his feet and spend the rest of his life dragging burdens like a mule? Huh, I never thought of it that way, they should said, her eyes clouding. Is that why, do you think that so many of them aren't cured? The thought was troubling to them both. They walked on in an uncertain silence, and then they just naturally happy spirits reasserted themselves. Have you thought, Daniel, of taking Leah to Jesus? Yes, I've thought of it, but I don't see how I could get her to Capernaum without frightening her to death. She asked once if Jesus would ever come to our village, but I don't suppose she would really have the courage. When he comes, if she will not go to him, then you must ask him to come to your house with you. He often goes with people, you know, to the centurion's house or to some rich man's. Yeah. Do you really think that that would make the slightest difference to Jesus? Mm, no, I guess it wouldn't. But somehow I wonder, it's the same as the lame man. It's not much of a world, is it? Is it worth trying to bring Leah back into it? They just stood still in the road. Yes, she cried. And Daniel was astounded to see that tears had sprung in her eyes. Oh, Daniel, yes. If only I could make you see somehow that it is. All this, she exclaimed, the sweep of her arm and including the deepening blue of the sky, the shining lake in the distance, the snow-covered mountain far to the north, so much. You must look at it all, Daniel, not just at the unhappy things. Suddenly she reached out and touched his hand. Look, she whispered. He lifted his head and followed her gaze. Overhead, barely discernible against the blue of the sky, a long gray shadow hung suspended. Cranes, hundreds of them, were passing in a great phalanx. They had wheeled and caught the sun, flashing light from the banks of the white feathers with a shimmering like snow on the mountain. Motionless, the two watched till the line slowly melted in the distant air. They should let out a breath. Whew, how beautiful, she sighed. It's beautiful just to be alive in Galilee. Daniel looked down at her. His head was still thrown back. Her head was still thrown back, her lips parted. He could see the pulse beating under her smooth ivory skin, and somehow the line of her throat was one of the, with the long, slow arc of the birds in flight. She was aware all at once of his look, and then that their hands were joined. Red surged up into the smooth cheeks, and she drew her hand away. For a moment, neither of them moved, and then they both began to hurry, almost to run. At the junction of the road, they passed two more Roman sentries, but this time the men did not speak, or even take notice of two dusty boys. For once, Daniel felt almost grateful to a Roman. Tonight, he could not have been born. He could not have been born to watch Stacia shoulder a pack. All right, now we're going to go to chapter 17. I'm going to watch my timer here. Doing great. This time the villager said to Daniel, as he halted the blows of his hammer, Rosh has gone too far. How do you know it was Rosh? Daniel inquired, keeping his eyes on the axe he was mending. Is there any other man in Galilee who would dare such a thing? Five of the wealthiest houses in the city robbed last night? But how would he find out? That's what I can't see. How would he know off that there on the mountain that Matthias was giving a banquet? Where which men would have taken half their slaves to make a showing? None of the rest of us even knew the Tetrarch was coming. Then how can you think it was Rosh? <laughs> I don't have to think. The legionaries found out. Rosh might not get away with it if he had been satisfied with the loot from the houses, but no, he had to make a night of it. Daniel started. Was there more to the story than not yet reached him? Hand on the bellows, he waited. Uh, they tried the house of the centurion himself, and he might have known the centurion wouldn't leave his house unguarded. Most likely the cutthroats got careless when they found the other houses such easy picking. Two of them were captured, both escaped convicts anyway, they say. One died as soon as he started to question him, but the other told before they finally made an end of him. 
And which, Daniel wondered sickly, which of these men had you lived by, with side by side in a cave? I say they deserve what they got, nothing but a pack of thieves up there for all the fine talk we used to hear. Not for a moment could Daniel let such a statement pass in his shop. Rosh is no bandit, he said. When he robs it, it's for good purpose. <laughs> so I've heard. Rob the rich to feed the poor. I'll be glad to see the poor that that gets one penny of what he took last night. There may be more important needs, said Daniel. Yeah, like filling his own stomach. We'll see he's satisfied now. We'll see if he lets our crops alone. I'll believe that from you when he, we can trust our sheep on the mountain. Daniel started up the bellows and cut off the rest of the man's complaint. This was the third man this morning who had brought the news that had slithered out of the city like a swarm of snakes to every village around about. Some men praised Rosh's daring, elated to see that rich men defrauded, but more like this man were indignant. At the first news, Daniel's spirits had soared, and then on the heels of rejoicing that come doubt. Now at the end of the day, he felt dull and let down. This then had been the reason for Joel's enterprise? A wholesale looting of rich men's houses? Somehow both boys had expected something more noble, more worthy of the cause. What did Joel think of it? Was it worth the hours lost from his study, the danger? No question what da Joel thought. That night, the meeting in the watchtower was jubilant. Bit by bit, the boys from the city had garnered every crumb of news to relate to the village boys. Joel was a hero twice over. Not only had he furnished all the information that made the raid possible, he had even returned this morning to the very doors of the robbed houses to listen to the full story for the unsuspecting kitchen slaves. I'm going to keep at it, he boasted. It would be a shame to give up such an opening. I've got a special order from the centurion's head steward. Two dozen fish every second, fourth day of the week, and there's no telling what I get a my, that I may chance on. He was far too elated to notice Daniel's silence. Is Rosh in danger? One of the boys asked. The yellow rat who was caught. Yellow, another boy objected. Do you know what the Romans do to a man? How long do you think they could keep quiet? There was an uncomfortable pause. This was a doubt they all faced in the night. In their own secret thoughts, they did not often speak of it. Don't worry about Rosh, Daniel assured them. The Romans have had a price on Rosh's head for years. It's another matter to lay a finger on him. Questions broke out again. What would Rosh do with the money? Would he buy arms with it? Would he divide it among the farms? Maybe pay back some of the sheep he'd killed? There were so many needs for the money. Daniel sat silent while they debated passionately the greatest needs for the stolen goods. Leave that to Rosh, he broke in finally. It's for the cause. The argument ended. They were perfectly satisfied. Looking at the circle of intense swarthy faces and the flashing eyes, feeling the unquestioning loyalty that bound them all to Rosh, Daniel cursed at his own heavy misgivings. Why could he not be satisfied with his own answer? Nor are the villagers satisfied. Every day in the shop in the marketplace at the door of the synagogue, one heard the name of Rosh, sometimes bitterly condemned, sometimes hotly defended. Timer check. At last, Rosh's name was on every lip, as he had once predicted. Some swore he was the defender of the Jews, but others pointed out that he had turned against the Jews. But though they murdered, most had clung with blind faith to Rosh. They still looked at the mountain as the stronghold of freedom and hope. The relay of messages which had succeeded so well was now intensified. Joel threw himself into the role of fish peddler, and with experience, he grew more shrewd in interpreting the bits of gossip, the signs of activity that he picked up in the doorways and kitchens of the city. Because he could not often leave home in the evening, other members of the band brought the messages to Daniel's shop, and at night, Jockton crept down the slopes like a jackal across the cucumber field to the watchtower and back to Rosh with the day's report. A mounting excitement filled the watchtower where boys met nearly every night in the week, here at last was something to do. Now they could see the results of their work, for the results were never far behind. Rosh had acquired at least the link with the city for which he had waited. The boys had given him a weapon which he needed. He struck far and wide with suddenness and cunning, 
Joel learned of a Galilean merchant who was expected to deliver seven cruises of oil to the centurion's household on the morrow. Though the merchant set out from his vineyard before dawn, neither he nor his oil was ever seen again. A bridegroom, son of the wealthiest elder of the synagogue, left the city with a gala party of his friends laden with gifts to claim his bride in, in Sephoris. The bride waited in vain. The next day, the whole party returned to their homes, clad only in their tunics, bereft of their handsome cloaks, their gifts, almost of their senses. A holiday party returning late by torchlight from the games in the theater at Tiberius was routed, stripped, and badly beaten. For none of these victims did the boys feel the slightest pity. Any trader who sold his goods to the Romans did so at his own risk, but those who flaunted their wealth or patronized a Roman theater were fair prey. And every cruise of oil, every silver talent, swelled the fund that would soon maintain the army of Israel. All right, I want to stop there. And um, when we resume on Thursday, I'll begin there, finish 17, and then we'll go on into how much of 18 that we can. Well, enjoy your Tuesday, and um, we have no homework for today. And I will see you at the usual live session today. Thanks.